Hello everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the first therapeutic Redjog Villa-led oncology podcast. Welcome to our special edition podcast in honour of Dying Matters Week. My name is Naaman Joel Anderson and I'm joined by my fellow host Joe McNamara. Hi everyone. So we're very, very excited and honoured to introduce our guest for this evening, um, Dr Catherine Mannix. Um, hi Catherine. Hello Naaman, hello Joe. Hi everyone. So, Catherine, I'm sure lots of people listening will know who you are, but would you mind just telling us a bit about yourself and your professional career up to now? Sure. Uh, I was uh, a palliative care doctor for about 30 years, uh, and that was a change in direction. So I started off in oncology, where I was indeed pals with therapeutic radiographers, very, very important members of our therapeutic community. Um, And... As a consultant in palliative medicine, I worked in the hospitals with other other colleagues, one of whom actually with the local therapeutic radiography team set up a palliative care suite um, in our local uh, can- cancer centre. So that was that was a really lovely piece of work that, that she did. So uh, I worked in palliative care for 30 years. We really thought that palliative care would kind of do itself out of the job over those 30 years, you know, that we'd get better and better at understanding how to support people through illnesses. Obviously, it started in cancer in 1986. It was mainly cancer when I started. Um, But we thought that we give the knowledge back to oncology and respiratory medicine and all those other specialists in long term conditions. Um, And so kind of 28 years in, I still having exactly the same conversations with people with exactly the same fears about not knowing what to expect during the end stages of their illness. And that was the point at which I thought, actually, do you know what, maybe I could do something more useful than seeing individual families one at a time. Maybe there's something that could be done about the public understanding of dying on a broader platform. So I didn't think I was going to do that on my own. And of course, there are great organisations out there already doing fantastic stuff. Macmillan, Marie Curie, um, Age UK, people like that. And there's the Dying Matters Coalition, which is lots and lots of different organisations. But I just thought maybe if I can take that experience of working in hospices and hospitals and people's homes and be, you know, an agent for them, if you like, maybe I can make a difference. And then just by really good fortune, I got invited to speak on BBC radio. In fact, the invitation came in my last day at work. Um, And I talked about dying on the radio. And that doesn't happen very much, it turns out. And so it ended up being repeated at public request. And then a literary agent heard it and got in touch with me and asked me if I'd ever thought about writing a book. So that's what happened. He helped me to devise how a book uh, would reach a publisher, got me a publishing deal. And the book is really, well, I I think, you know, it's just stories. It's about how people live while they're dying of a variety of illnesses. And what I was really trying to do was think about how my grandmother had understood dying because she'd seen loads of it as as a young woman in the 1920s and 1930s. She was just familiar with it. But by the time she reached her old age and was talking about her own death, her concern was that her children hadn't seen dying. They were the generation that reaped the benefits of the National Health Service and all the great treatments and things we've got. And it was at that point I realised that actually people only know about dying from newspapers and terrible plot lines in EastEnders and things like that. And if we want people to understand it, then they need to understand it the way my grandmother understood it, which was by being there. So that's why I chose stories, really, to help people to feel as though they are there by sitting beside me as we're looking at this story unfolding. So that's it. It's very simple. It's just stories, but it's stories is the way we've always dealt with difficult stuff since time immemorial. I'm just following a long tradition. Catherine, Catherine, it's evident from how you speak that you're really passionate about about dying. And 
I am fully aware from reading your books and listening to numerous webinars that you use death and dying and that terminology rather than passed away or leaving us. Why is that? Why do people and why should they refer to death and dying rather than maybe tiptoeing around that fact, do you think? It's a fraught question, isn't it? So I, I would first of all say that if if you're bereaved or if you're a person who's approaching your own death the words you use that get you through that's your business and nobody should be judging anybody for whatever language they decide to use whatever bizarre humor they decide to use people uh, and i know you'll have seen this in your work and i've certainly seen it in mine using the the, the weirdest language and the oddest humor to just get themselves through the day and that's what they need to do but I think when we are meeting them in a professional capacity there's a danger that by using a euphemism we think we've said something gently and kindly but often what we've done is we've said something unclearly and so what we think we've said and what they heard us say are not the same thing so I think you can use those d words dying and dead and death with immense compassion and I think people will remember how the conversation felt to them the warmth of it the kindness of it the supportiveness of it and they may not even realize that the words that you used were so stark as dying and death but if you don't have compassion even if you're using euphemisms a person can feel unsupported and that there's a lack of kindness or a lack of tailoring to their particular circumstances so i think it, it helps to be clear and if we're not clear the people don't understand there's really good research uh, done in oncology about oncologists telling people about a poor pro poor prognosis and they were tape recorded and those recordings were listened to and the patients were interviewed afterwards. And quite often the patients did not realize that they'd just been told a poor prognosis. And when you listen to the recordings, it's all been written up, this is Leslie Fallowfield's work. You realize that the language was soft, there were euphemisms, it wasn't directly addressed, that the person rushed to very quickly offer other treatment or reassurance instead of breaking horrible news with the best kindness they could muster and then just sitting with the person while they take that in you can't turn it into good news we can't make it better all you can really do is be somebody's companion in that awful place while they take that in and really bring it home to themselves what it means it's very interesting you say that so i read a book called compassionomics as you might have heard of this talks about empathy, compassion in all aspects of healthcare. And actually one of the stats, I think, I can't remember what it is, but it was almost 50% of physicians or oncologists in America used to stop the patient even in their opening line. So, you know, when you have a patient come to you, you ask them, how are you doing? Or, you know, what's on your mind? What do you want to discuss? And that's what they, they said that actually 50% would stop them, but more maybe just out of tiredness. And I wonder if that's something at the moment with COVID going on that lots of people might be feeling as well. I think that's true. I think the workload of, of everybody has just been so different, hasn't it? Because we haven't been able to work the way we usually work. We've been trying to have conversations that need to be tender and gentle and clear and kind on the phone or through video calls. So that makes it feel completely different. And then a lot of people's work has been displaced. So now we've got people presenting late knowing they're presenting late, knowing they sat on a lump for a long time because there was no service to respond to them because the service itself was diverted because of COVID. So staff, people are just so tired, aren't they? And sometimes when you're really tired, you might miss a cue. You might not just hear the nuance in what somebody's saying. You might not notice that they are looking frightened. They're not ready for you to say the next difficult thing quite yet. Um, so I think maybe we're getting into a situation where we're upsetting each other. Um, patients, 
feeling grieved because they've waited too long and then when they are seen taking that out on the person who is seeing them rather than the system that prevented them from being seen in the first place and then the staff who are meeting those people who are anxious and cross and sad are themselves weary and sad and quite cross about the situation too so it's a bit of a perfect storm isn't it we do really need to lean in and look after each other so that we can be well enough to be the practitioners that our patients need us to be i think at the moment joe and i were talking about this earlier that unfortunately we are starting to see some of the backlog patients coming through to so individuals who have not been able to get a scan go to their gp they've come through now and they're saying well actually I'm far more advanced than I was before and they haven't had time to process it because again just as you said people are still coming to terms with the pandemic now they've managed to get all their starting treatment and it's yeah it it is quite hard at the moment I think there's lots of colleagues that Joe and I work with who are really struggling I suppose myself included now and then It's, it's a lot of a burden that you take on where you're angry about the situation for your patient but there isn't a lot you can do sometimes and it's what you said we talk about active listening and using silences but It does get to a point where you hear that every day through lots of different patients. It's quite hard, isn't it? How do you cope with that or how did you cope with that? So I think I think that's a really good question. And you would think after this amount of time, I'd have worked out the answer to it, wouldn't you? But I I really don't know. I think that we find our way into the areas of medicine where the rewards balance the difficulties. And so if you're really interested in engineering and the beautiful movement of a joint and restoring somebody's mobility you'll be an orthopedic surgeon and you'll spend a lot of time in an operating theater feeling very hot under lots of um, ppe doing the thing that you do for the joy of seeing that person walking better or moving their arm better or whatever afterwards um I'm a people person, so I ended up in a specialty that was all about people and relating to people. And the the beauty about palliative care is that we're meeting people who think they're never going to feel any better again. And we're helping them to feel better. And, you know, one of those wonderful things in in oncology is, is offering somebody, you know, palliative radiotherapy for bone pain that just absolutely transforms their experience of those last months or weeks of life. That's a fantastic thing to be able to do, isn't it? So the balance of of the sadness and the difficulties in palliative care, for me, was the highs of the difference that it makes to people to be able to live really well until really, really late in their illness. So I, I guess we just find the thing that suits us and palliative care suited me. Catherine, I know that um, from experience and talking to colleagues that there may be seeing patients who've had consultations over the phone, who maybe have had experiences like you described, where maybe they haven't necessarily really grasped the severity of the situation and maybe the plans, the fact, you know, what is palliative care? Sometimes even that as a terminology, patients don't understand or I've definitely had it where I've been in outpatients clinic where a patient's received a letter saying oncology and they didn't realise that oncology meant cancer Mm. and they purely thought they were coming to talk about a chest infection and then being told that they had cancer. So I think we are seeing that maybe therapeutic radiographers and other allied health professions are having conversations with patients about death and dying and palliative care and their interventions that would usually have been done earlier on in their cancer pathway or that they may have had those conversations, but now they're within some kind of therapeutic um, scenario that the allied health profession is having those conversations. Is there any advice that you would give to to those people about compassionately addressing death and dying and and making sure that their wishes are heard um, and being observed? Whoa, that's a huge question. So let's, let's chunk that down a little bit. So first of all, when we're meeting a person who is in our care for treatment or support or both of those things, we really need to understand what they understand before we can actually then move their understanding forward. So 
patients get really fed up, don't they, with telling their story over and over again? Haven't you got records? Can't you read this stuff? Aren't there letters? My GP told you all about this, etc. But a good way of helping somebody to help us to understand what they know is to retake their medical history by saying, you know, the truth. I, I got access to your records here. I can see this all started with, you know, a lump that you found on such and such a date and that you've had quite a bit of treatment before you met me here today. Or, you know, I can see that you've had surgery with Dr. So-and-so and she has informed us about blah, blah, blah. What I'd really like to know from you is how it's felt to be you going through all of that treatment and what sorts of things have been explained to you as it's been going along. So you are in fact taking the medical history again, but you're not asking them to say, I found a lump, I had a biopsy, um, that got called back, blah, blah, blah. You're asking them to say, when I first found the lump, I never dreamt it could be cancer or I immediately realized it was cancer and I was just so terrified waiting for the biopsy results. Um, and then when I had my uh, original radical radiotherapy with curative intent, um, I really didn't expect what the side effects were going to be. And, you know, the, the worst part for me was I couldn't swallow my own saliva and it was so sore or, or, or whatever. And that way, what they're getting from us is a space to tell their story. What we're getting from them is what they've understood about the story and what kind of strategies they've used for coping. So it shows us their individual way of telling their story and understanding their story. But the other really important thing is as somebody tells us their story and we're listening to it, they are listening to it too. And so they start to move themselves almost as though they're crossing a river on stepping stones. Oh, well, it started with a lump and then I had treatment and the treatment was supposed to cure it and things were okay for a while, but then there was this problem. And then when the problem didn't go away, there was this test and then they discovered this. And that was devastating because my son was about to get married and I didn't know whether I'd have hair for the wedding or I didn't know whether I'd be able to travel to get there or, or whatever. So now you're taking kind of emotional history of what's happened. But as they're listening to it, they're also recognising, oh yeah, we started off, we thought it was curable, they gave me the treatment to cure me, but then this happened and that showed it wasn't cured. And that was the point at which I realised probably it never was going to be cured. And now I have to live with it, but I'm not as well as I've been and I'm more tired. Things aren't going very well, are they? So actually they're telling themselves the story. And that brings them now to a point where we can catch them up, if you like. We can now add the next bit. So I've heard you tell me about hoping to be cured, being great for a while then being not so good, then realising it hadn't been cured. And what I'm wondering now is what's going through your mind? What's your best hope about this? What's your worst dread about this? Because what I want to do is help you to live the way that's closest to your best hope and furthest from your worst dread. So let's have a little think about that. And people can tell us that. That's a really helpful way into the conversation because they've brought us to the place where we're talking about the difficulties they're experiencing and we're not starting by giving them another wallop of bad news we're starting by creating a space where they can be curious about what's going on and the news that we've got can now be slotted into that how do you set, do you the, set ceiling, the ceiling um i suppose for conversations or treatments especially i'd say more so with the family members so obviously healthcare isn't always about the the individual going through the treatment being a bystander is very difficult how when you're in that kind of conversation do you set the ceiling with family members and their expectations it's really tricky isn't it because family members just want you to make this person better and you know they'd they, they'd sell their kidney if if you would make that person better so i think we have to be kind and truthful at the same time so when there is no longer a prospect of cure, we have to say that. 
And now we have to say, OK, so because we know now this illness can no longer be cured, the emphasis could be on helping this person to live as well as possible for however long that turns out to be. Or some people prefer the emphasis to be on getting as many weeks, months, days, hours of life as possible. And there isn't a right answer to this. There's the answer that feels most important to the person with the illness right now. And I know you're her son and you love her dearly, but it's actually not what you think or what I think that counts here. It's what she thinks. So we need to have that conversation together in a way that helps her to help us to understand and feel under no pressure from us at all to take this one way or another. Um, so usually I take family with me to have those conversations, provided the patient's given permission. Um, and I would talk about it as boldly as that. You know, sometimes we're talking about length of life and sometimes we're talking about the quality of the life that you're living. And it kind of depends what's on the horizon. If you've got your grandchild's wedding on the horizon, and that's a really important kind of land in, line in the sand for you, and you want to live until then, you might be prepared to put up with treatments that have quite severe toxicities. And the toxicity of the treatment itself can be something that can be part of the burden, can even be life shortening. And we know that, don't we? We know there are very good studies now that people who opt out of active treatment earlier very often live longer than people who persist in active treatment. But if you want to be sure of getting to that wedding, you might accept the debulking surgery or the, 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 the radiotherapy or fairly toxic chemotherapy for a month or two now, and then take a month or two to recover to be well enough to get to the wedding. After the wedding, you might say, OK, that's it now. This is all about quality of life for me. It's all about how comfortable I am. It's all about being able to see the people I love. It's all about sorting things out, tying up all the loose ends. And that's great. OK, so we go with you now. And all of the, the, the targets are different. The goals of care are different. And then this person comes back and says, you remember I went to that wedding? She's pregnant. I want to see the baby born. And now we're all up in the air again. And sometimes at that point, we have to have a, another conversation that says, actually, do you know what? I would love you to see that baby. I would love to see the photo of you with that baby in your arms. But I can't promise you that we can keep you alive that long. It's possible, but I can't make that promise. So what do you want to do now that's about celebrating this pregnancy? What do you want to do now that's about making your love apparent to that baby, even if you're not here for that photograph? Are you a knitter? Um, do you want to stop buying things that are baby sized? Are you going to write some cards? Do you want to write letters? Have you got things in the attic you always thought you'd get out? Do you want to get them out and start to sort them out? Will you get the pleasure of doing that? So this is about love. It's about joy. It's really, really important. And I'm not going to add to the love and I'm not going to add to the joy by giving you treatment that makes you feel as wretched as hell and still not survive to see the baby. So help me to help you by understanding what matters most right now. Catherine, that leads really nicely onto my next question about what is the difference between supportive and palliative care? I know that there's um, people in the audience that may never have heard those terminologies before. Can you kind of explain what they are? I think it's an Americanism. And I think it's because of the insurance system in America where there are criteria for palliative care. There are criteria for hospice, which in America isn't a building or um, a place where you get your symptoms sorted out. It's a team and a service. And it's an assumption that you are now receiving terminal care, end of life care. So we're using the language that uses the same words. It's English on both sides of the Atlantic, but these things mean completely different things. And because oncologists have been fearful of mentioning the P word, 
palliative. We know that palliative care gets introduced later than it should be by a lot of people. And we know that oncology nurses and therapeutic radiographers and allied healthcare professionals get very, very cross that patients are not receiving timely palliative care, but oncologists who are charged with the delicate conversation of introducing palliative care feel somehow they're letting their patient down if they start to talk about palliative care. But if they call it supportive care, then somehow that doesn't scare them quite so much. I think it's not helpful. I think whatever we call the care service, eventually that name will become associated with the fact that a large number of the patients receiving it have advanced and advancing disease and are facing the end of their lives. So, you know, we could call it the flower power service so that we don't frighten people so much, but in three years time, nobody's going to want to refer to the flower power team either. So it's actually really much more about us having the courage to say in the same way as you would if you had a patient whose heart was doing bizarre, erratic things. I'm not an expert in the kind of things your heart is doing at the moment. I have cardiology colleagues who are experts. I'm going to ask one of them to come and see you and advise us both about how we do this. Somehow for the palliative care conversation, oncologists ask patients permission to refer instead of having exactly the same form of words, which is, I am not an expert in managing some of these symptoms. I have colleagues who are, I'm going to ask them to come and advise us how to manage this. It's not a permission seeking exercise. Everybody has the right to the best possible quality of life. And you would use a cardiologist to help with somebody's heart failure. And you'd use a chest physician if you had somebody who was, you know, horribly breathless and was getting pleural effusions all the time and you want it tapped under ultrasound or whatever. The palliative care service is exactly the same. It's a specialist arm of the oncology division and it should just be used because it's there from diagnosis. And maybe if we actually had more particularly surgical oncologists thinking the way one of our local teams did, uh, where the big upper GI surgical oncology service was in the hospital where I served. And it would be routine for those patients who had radical esophagectomy with curative intent to meet the palliative care team over their first week post-op because their gut was plumbed in differently. They had a long scar in their abdomen and another one in their chest. Their peristalsis was all over the place. They had nasogastric tubes down, tickling the back of their throat. So we expected them to have post-operative pain. We expected them to have nausea because of the procedure and the tube. And we expected that those symptoms would be managed by an expert team in symptom control, the palliative care team, which got them out of hospital faster got them ambulant and fit and safe faster and therefore got them to their consolidating radical radiotherapy or chemotherapy or whatever else sooner as well. So early palliative care was actually about improving their survival statistics. It was nothing to do with dying. We've got to see it as symptom management expertise and, and stop thinking it's somehow um, we're administering coffin lids at the same time as we're giving advice about antiemetics. I mean, we often refer sort of patients on, you know, via the palliative care pathway, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily a palliative patient. I think that's something, when I was a student, I loved being part of the palliative care team to learn, but whenever they would say, look, I'm going to introduce my title, but this doesn't mean that you're not on a radical pathway. We're just here to help you manage your pain going through this treatment. That's something I think I've seen quite a lot. Um, yeah. I'm presuming that's something that you've probably had different conversations with people about as well, Catherine. Yeah, I think it's really important that, Patients see that there's, there's this arm of the service that specialises in symptom management. And any time their symptoms are troublesome, that team can be consulted. And it's a team that will dip in and out. And in fact, when you think about the pattern of treatment for cancer patients, everybody else dips in and out, don't they? So you might have a radiotherapy team that's working with you for a while, and then, then they're not anymore. And your follow-up might be with a medical oncologist, clinical oncologists, surgical oncologists, but the rest of the key players are dipping in and out all of the time and palliative care isn't any different from that. How do you, 
I suppose, around death and dying, what are your experiences with cultural differences? So where I'm from, um, my grandma loves to talk about death every Sunday when we talk to each other. She's just happy. She's had a great life. But lots of my friends or even my fiance, her family, are not very well rehearsed of talking about death. Um, what, what have your experiences been in the past with cultural differences? It's really, really interesting, isn't it? Because one of the things about cultural differences is to not make any assumptions about somebody's culture from their name or the religion that's written on their forms or whatever. The way we find out about the way an individual's family deals with dying and death is to ask them. Um, and what we'll find is, for example, that people who are culturally of Western Irish heritage, I oh, didn't expect me to go there, did you? Western Irish heritage, they're great at death. But um, as, as the, the author and producer Kevin Toulis points out, they're only great at death from the deathbed onwards. They're not really good at talking about dying and the prep and that kind of stuff. You know, so don't make the assumption that because I'm from the west of Ireland, I'm going to be happy to talk about my end of life care. I'm not, la la la, I'm not listening. But I want to wake and I want them to carry me from the house and I want them to bury me in the traditional uh, churchyard. And I've chosen all of the hymns for what will inevitably be a requiem mass because culturally that's what it's going to be. Um, You've just, just described my father in law to a T, okay. Catherine. <laughs> So the same thing um, when we're talking to a Muslim family, a Muslim family that is newly arrived here from Somalia is going to be very different from a third generation British Asian family living in Bradford. And so what we need to be thinking about is not what do I know about Islam and end of life care It's what do I know about this person and their family and their resources and their understanding. And because I'm not from that culture, just as I'm not from a West of Ireland culture, I have to ask the family, how do we best help you? How do we best support you so that the care that you get meets the needs that you have? Sometimes it can be difficult because there are ways of decision making in some communities that are very different from our traditional British model of autonomy. So families who make decisions on behalf of the person feels to us like that's not the way it should work. And yet in New Zealand, the extended family, the Fano, would always be the vehicle that makes the decision. You'd be involved in it, but it wouldn't just be your decision. It would be your Fano's decision about whether to go and live in a hospital that's four hours car ride away for the rest of the rest of the family, or whether to stay in a little local hospital and maybe have less treatment options, but be closer to home. So I think we've got to be a little bit more humble, haven't we, about cultural respect and not think that the culture that we come from, whatever that is, is right. The culture that the person comes from and that they feel comfortable with is right for them. And we have to help with that. When it becomes a little bit difficult is when we've got families where the generations are different. And so we've got the younger generation um, objecting to the way we're dealing with a parent generation, for example. And, and that can be terribly difficult. But we, we have to be humble and we have to work with families and sometimes with the people who they would identify as their cultural representatives. And one of the things I think is really sad is we're losing access to interpreter services in the NHS because it's so expensive. And it's really important, isn't it, for people to understand that interpretation is not the same as translation. That I can remember working with a man who was uh, a, a Muslim from Sarajevo who was a refugee during the war there. And his translator interpreter who was coming into the hospice where he was being looked after was really, really helpful because he was able to tell us not just what the man was saying or the questions the person was asking, but to say the context of this kind of question in the part of Kosovo that this person came from um, 
would be that this would normally be a decision that would be made by the imam in consultation with the family, for example, and he and he hasn't got a mosque to belong to here. So he's trying to make guesses in the dark and the interpreter was a Christian. So he couldn't really help with it either. He could explain the cultural differences. We couldn't really help. So we we need to just be respectful and, and ask people to help us to help them, I think. You always have a I, I, sorry. You always have a spiritual person. That's what I would call them because there there's so many different titles from different spiritualities. But uh, as part of the palliative care team, normally, don't you? We have at least have access to them, even if they're not a designated core member of the team. And chaplaincy serv- services are really really important because very often um, the cultural spiritual leaders in the community won't be as familiar with the technical end of medicine as faith leaders who work in chaplaincy can be and so sometimes we need to ask our our muslim chaplain or our uh, baha'i chaplain to work with the faith leader that's known to the family because they perhaps feel that the withdrawal of treatment conversation is taking over from God rather than recognising futility and not starting on something that just isn't going to be helpful. Whereas the hospital chaplain is much more likely to understand the nuances of that and to also be able to vouch for the caring team to say, no, this isn't a team that's going to try and press a different agenda a Western agenda, an atheist agenda, a Christian agenda, whatever it is. This is about them trying to do the least harm and the most good, and then be able to translate that through whatever is the scripture of that particular faith to say these these are the parts of our scripture that support these actions by these medical people. Um, but we don't want you to persuade the patient. That's the difficult thing all the time, isn't it? We want you to be able to support the patient whilst they think through all of the options, rather than saying that one or two of these options would be culturally or theologically forbidden. So sometimes our chaplains are helping patients and families directly, but sometimes our chaplains are working to support faith leaders in the community who clearly are theologically very adept, but don't have the same knowledge about theology as applied to medicine. So interesting, Catherine. Thank you. Um, when we start to think about death, I, I have had the privilege of um, being with lots of family members who have died and also members of the public and within my role as a therapeutic radiographer. Um, what happens when someone dies? What, what can people expect? We have lots of patients who listen to the podcast. What is it that they should come to expect from, from dying? Jo, thank you for asking me that question, because actually that's what I want to kind of proclaim from the rooftops. So I guess the the summary statement is it's probably not as bad as most people are expecting. Um, And I meet a lot of people at book festivals who come along to get their books signed. And they come along and they get to the front of the queue. And it's often a very long wait because every person in front of them has been telling me their story about their person and their illness and their bereavement and they're always wonderful stories and they're full of 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 love for those people so eventually you get to the front of the queue and they say well I I I just wanted to say and then you see them looking over their shoulder to check whether anybody can hear them I was with my brother sister husband child mother whoever when they were dying and it, it seems strange to say this but and they look over their shoulder again is anybody listening to me do you know, it, it was it was really rather beautiful, um, or it was lovely, or it was very gentle, um, and those things that you say about the person becoming unconscious, gradually losing consciousness, their breathing changing and slowing down, and that's exactly what happened, and they're surprised. Now I'm not surprised because what they're describing to me, I know, is what dying looks like, ordinary dying looks like. But what they're saying as they're looking over their shoulders is, obviously, we never tell anybody how lovely it was when our dear person died. 
because we know we're so lucky to have something so unusual happen to us because we know usually it's terrible. And I feel like weeping. I just want to say, no, no, no. I'm so glad that that was your experience. But please tell people because what you saw is ordinary dying. It's probably what you'll see the next time you see somebody die. It's probably what will happen when it's your turn because that's what it looks like. But because we only know about the ones that go wrong, because sometimes it is difficult, sometimes it isn't smooth, but that's really rare. But those are the times when a family is traumatised, they complain to a hospital, it gets into the local newspapers, they write to their MPs, it gets into the national newspapers. And it's kind of the same as if we only knew about air travel, what we read in the papers, see on the news or see in the cinema, we would never get on a plane, would we? Because we know they're either going to plunge out of the sky, there's going to be unfettered snakes on board, people are going to be fighting, the pilot will be drunk, it'll arrive at the wrong airport. You know, obviously, air travel is just terrifying. And yet those we know those are the really, really rare exceptions. Or, you know, snakes, snakes on a plane, I think, is complete fantasy. I hope it's complete fantasy. <laughs> but you might see Bruce Willis somewhere. <laughs> so, so there's the thing. We've completely got what ordinary dying looks like wrong because all we've seen is extraordinary dying in newspapers and in you know on on screen. And so Coronation Street did a dying story. Might have been the year before COVID. It's a bit of a time slip now. So it might have been three or four years ago. A young woman with cervical cancer. And they did it beautifully and they did it really well right to the very end of her life. She wanted to stay at home. She was a young mum. She was concerned about the ongoing care of her child after she died. She wanted her family to keep her at home. It got too difficult for them to keep her at home. She ended up having to be admitted to a hospice, which wasn't what she really wanted, but where her symptoms really got settled down where she was able to say the really important things, where the family was talking around the bed as she was peacefully losing consciousness in the way that I'd seen, you know, I don't know how many thousands of times. And it's the first time I've seen dying done properly on television. And I have to say that Coronation Street deserve all of the awards and they got loads of awards for that storyline, not just because it was brilliantly acted, but because it was such a stunningly accurate portrayal of what really happens. So what does really happen? What really happens is not just for people with cancer, but any illness where you die of just being too tired to keep going. So if your heart isn't working well or your liver or your kidneys or your lungs, if you're dying of any one of those sorts of things, as well as cancer, it's mainly just that your energy runs out. And so in the months, before you die, you find that you're running out of energy and you can't do the things that you used to be able to do so easily. You often find that you're not as hungry or interested in drinking as you used to be and that's okay. Families of course get really, really anxious because you're not eating enough, but actually if you're not moving very much, you don't need an awful lot of calories anyway. Um, Sleep is the most important thing at this point because it isn't really food so much as sleep that recharges your energy batteries. So anybody who's listening is worrying about their favourite afternoon nap. I'm not talking about you and your afternoon nap. Afternoon nap is fine. It's this creeping loss of energy that when you look back month by month, you can see it's a gradual change that's becoming gradually more extreme. And it's kind of like what happens when we get a really bad dose of flu, where you're so tired you just can't get out of bed eventually. But with flu, you're going to get better again on at the other side of it. But for people who are moving towards the end of their lives, they're just getting more and more tired. They're doing less and less. But if the illness isn't affecting their brain or their mind, it's still them. They still love the things they love, love the people they love, don't start to like people they didn't like before any more than they used to like them. Um, and as time goes by, people sleep more to recharge their energy batteries. They do less before their energy runs out until at the very, very end of somebody's life. They're mainly choosing to stay in bed or in a chair almost all of the day. 
they're sleeping for almost all of the time, they're occasionally awake. They're sometimes in that state that's slightly between being asleep and being awake, which makes them a little bit muddled. And what's really important for family and friends then is just to stay really calm. This is okay. It's not dangerous. Calm voices help to keep the room calm, help to keep the mood calm. You might need to remind somebody what the time is and what the day is, and maybe even who you are a couple of times if they've just come round from a deep nap. And at the very end of somebody's life, they are simply not asleep now, although they look asleep, but they're unconscious. And what's really important about unconsciousness is it it means what the word says, unconscious. We're not conscious of what's going on, including what's happening in our bodies. And so we don't feel the back of our throat. We don't clear the back of our throat. So we're breathing through saliva or phlegm and it makes that funny clicky, bubbly noise. We're still breathing perfectly OK, but it's a disconcerting noise. They call it the death rattle because it usually only happens towards the very end of life. Um, it's not harming the person, makes the family feel a little bit anxious. Sometimes we use drugs to try and dry up their saliva. It's the only time in medicine I can think of where we treat one person to make everybody else in the room feel better because it's not bothering the person at all. Um, sometimes removing their position in bed will drain the saliva to one side or another make them a little bit less noisy, move the pillow. Um, one of the things we do know from recent research that I think is really lovely is that we've always thought unconscious people might be able to hear us, but we weren't sure. And there's some recent research from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, in Canada, where some palliative care patients agreed to wear EEG monitors, brainwave monitors on their heads while they were dying. And what the researchers can see is the brain waves changing from being awake brain waves to being relaxed to being asleep, then waking up again, relaxing back to sleep and then deeper than sleep into unconsciousness. And then, you know, sleeping and waking the way we see people until eventually it's just unconscious brain waves all of the time. Brain waves are slower and slower, more and more deeply unconscious. But Every time there's a noise in the room, there's a little spike of brain activity. Now, we don't know whether it's just that the brain is reacting to noise or whether the brain is going, oh, that's my son's voice or that's my daughter singing my favourite song. We can't tell what it is that they're hearing, but we do know that the brain still responds to sound, even as people are dying. And so all those years where the nurses who trained me trained me to talk to dying people and trained me to tell families to talk around the bed and to talk to the dying person. That makes me feel so much better because that really is an important thing. And we do know that very often people look more settled when the right voices are in the room. So here's this person completely unconscious now. Breathing now is just automatic cycles, sometimes deep, and sometimes shallow, moving backwards and forwards between fast breathing and slower breathing, and sometimes with gaps. And those cycles can repeat sometimes for days. It's really hard to know how long that's going to go on for. Families always ask, and we're really useless at knowing. So if you want to be there, now is the time to bring your slippers in and sit by the bed um, and, and just be there for that vigil. And what you'll see at the very, very end of somebody's life is that their breathing starts to develop pauses and the pauses get longer um, and there'll be a breath out that doesn't seem any different from any of the other breaths out, but this one just doesn't have another breath in after it. So that's not what Hollywood does. That's not how EastEnders plays it. And sometimes it's so gentle that the family don't notice it's happened. And all of us in palliative care have had the experience of walking into a room where a person has taken their last breath and the family are still sitting around, they're drinking tea, they're playing cards, they're chatting to each other, they're stroking the person's arm. And the person's died so peacefully that they just haven't realised it's happened. And what a wonderful last gift, really, for your family, 
for them to be able to see as those people who talk to me at book festivals have seen that dying it's no big shakes really of course it's sad we can't stop it from being sad if we love people and they die we will be sad if we love people and we're dying we'll be sad about the loss of our future with them but it isn't terrifying it isn't painful it isn't something that's shocking and sudden and choking and drowning and all of those awful things that people worry about it's incredibly gentle and once people understand what's happening and don't mistake those breathing noises for obstruction in the breathing choking drowning as long as they know what's going on and can keep pace with it then they can sit there to the very last breath knowing that they were a companion to their beloved person and that their person was safe while they were dying. Wow, I think I'm going to listen to that over and over again. That was an amazing way to explain it. I've read it in your book a few times, but hearing it like this, it, it really hits you, I think. Um, but I suppose if anyone who's listening, Catherine, what happens after that person's died? What happens to them or the family members in the room? So, well, I can't answer the metaphysical question of what happens to them, but generally what happens in the setting where they are. So the first thing is that if, you, if you're at home when you die, and a lot of people would like to be, even though sometimes it's too difficult eventually for family to pull that off, there's no rush. There's no need to rush at all. Just take your time and be with the person you might want to send for the rest of the family. People might want to come in. They might want to lie on the bed, give the person a cuddle. They might want to comb their hair. They might want to put their makeup on. If you die at home, the district nurses will come in to do what they call last offices, which is giving the person a last wash, um, changing them into maybe a clean nighty or some other clothes that they'd already decided that they wanted to wear. Um, and it's nice if they ask the family if they want to join in with that because often families find it very comforting to be part of doing that last bathing of a person that they've loved very dearly and it's nice if the nurses are there to do those parts that feel a bit too private for family to want to be part of but some families will want to be part of all of it and that's absolutely fine. A funeral director will come and take away the person's body at the point that you feel ready for them to do that. If it's a child, you can often borrow a cooling mattress from your local children's hospice service and keep the child at home in a room with no heating in it on a cooling mattress just to stop bodily changes starting to happen until you're really ready to say goodbye. A lot of children's hospices offer the service of a cold room with a cold bed or a cold cot in it and the family can go and live in that room alongside their dead child for a week or so if that's the time they need to really get used to the idea that the child has died and sometimes that's helpful for brothers and sisters to understand that they're really not going to wake up again. Um, funeral director will help family to understand what their choices are about how the body of their dead person is looked after and how to visit and what kind of arrangements they want to make for a funeral. The staff in a hospital or a hospice will usually try to respect family time around the bed for as long as they can but it kind of depends whereabouts in the hospital you might be and if you're in a high dependency setting where another person might die if they can't get into that bed soon then it may be necessary to move people sooner than feels comfortable to the family, sooner than feels comfortable to the staff sometimes. But there's a chapel of rest in every hospital where you can carry on sitting with your dead person for as long as you like. Um, I'm trying to think what else I need to tell you. It's visiting arrangements at the hospital, the staff will be able to tell you. And then you somebody needs to notify the um, the town hall or the civic centre, the registrar of deaths, that a death has happened. My recommendation to families for doing that is they're going to be given a medical certificate by either their GP at home or one of the doctors in the hospital or hospice 
that says the cause of the person's death. That's the certificate that the, that the um, registrar uses to make the actual death certificate itself. My advice to families is always to phone the registrar's office and make an appointment to go because otherwise you go and you sit in a waiting room in a queue and you're there to register a death and in the waiting room there are people who are waiting to go through for their wedding, there are excited people waiting to register the birth of the baby and sometimes it's comforting to see that the whole circle of life is still going on around you but for some people that's just a little bit too hard. So having a timed appointment, it can be really helpful and registrars do offer that service. The other thing that registrars can do is give you information about or even contact for you a service called Tell Us Once. Tell Us Once is a government service that started a few years ago in response to people complaining that they had to tell lots and lots of separate government services that a death had happened. So Tell Us Once will tell people like the pensions agency, the passport agency, driving licenses, um, local library, um, council for council tax and things like that. So local government and national government agencies will be informed so you shouldn't be getting letters from the library about your books being overdue, for example, which just can be really upsetting, can't it? Um, you might need to think about finding a list of all of the other people who who need to be told and there, there are some there are lists online there's a, there's a really good government website that's called what to do when somebody dies that gives lots and lots of good advice and then my other piece of really important advice is get at least three quotes from funeral directors because the costs can vary astronomically and the bigger the cost doesn't necessarily mean the better the service so go with somebody who makes you feel comfortable at a cost that you can afford. Thank you, Catherine. And I know that just listening to you and how eloquent you are and articulate about dying and death can see why you're an expert in this field and why <laughs> absolutely people want to listen to you talking about death and dying. Um, it's not necessarily a subject that I would have thought um, that I could listen to for probably a day, but with you talking about it, Catherine, I definitely think I could. Um, Catherine, have you thought about your own death? Because I know that I'm quite open and I think it's being a healthcare professional and um, I kind of, I'm not afraid to die and I'm quite open with my family. Is that something that you find because it's part of your whole work, oh, yeah. really? It's part of who you are. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to feel really robbed if I don't get a terminal illness. You know, if I just suddenly have a heart attack or get hit by a bus, that would just be so <laughs> Um because I think that a terminal illness, sad though that is, is a gift. It's a time for just getting your ducks in a row and for putting things straight. And that might be about clearing out the attic. I really need to clean out the attic, Joe. I really need to do that. Um, but it might be, more importantly, about those relationships that have got a bit wobbly that you want to make sure are okay and you're not leaving people vulnerable to a worse bereavement than they need because they think they've fallen out with you in some way a press that that appreciation for the people who've meant so much to us all those thank yous these are the things we hear people saying all the time at the end of their lives i'm sorry or i forgive you those kind of fence mending conversations and thank you all that appreciation and i love you and you know we're not very good with our d words but crikey we're terrible with the l word aren't we? Do you know, it's really awkward to say I love you to um, a colleague who, who you've admired and loved for years, loved working with, and consider them a friend, but you've never told them that you love them. But you do, really, because there are so many different ways of loving people. So yeah, I would like enough time to get things ready, and I'd like not to be horribly debilitated too early in that process so I am a bit picky about my style of dining um, but actually in the end I think what it comes down to is being able to live happily in our head if that's the only bit of us that's still working so learning early in life to treasure the way we think about things to be able to 
contemplate life, enjoy listening to music or audio books or whatever it is, um, looking at things that give us pleasure, being able to, you know, I would like to be in this room and look out and see those trees outside because that is enormously meaningful to me. Some of them we planted. This is the house where my children grew up. Um, but at the end of the day, I would want it to be the least bother it could be for the people that I love as well. So rather than giving them a list of don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other, what I think we all need to do is say to people, listen, these are the things that matter the most to me. If there are choices that need to be made and I'm not up to joining in the choices that day, just bear these priorities in mind. And what matters most to me is my family, is being able to see nature and sky, is being able to have a quiet and contemplative space. If they can make that happen somewhere, even if it can't be here, it probably isn't the room that the bed is in that matters, is it? It's the people around the bed that matter. And they're quite transportable. Oh, thank you. That's very deep and meaningful, but a really nice way to probably come towards the end of the podcast. Otherwise, I think Catherine would be listening to you for a few more hours if we could. You've touched on some brilliant top tips and kind of anything really for anyone to listen to, but... If you had to close and round this off, um, what would be your, kind of your top tips for people to take away about death and dying, especially for Dying Matters Week? I would like people over Dying Matters Week to have a conversation with people who matter most to them, to say these are the things that matter most to me, because one day that might be the person who's being asked by somebody like you what would this person say if they were able to tell us what matters most to them now because we've got these difficult medical decisions to make and for families to be left saying oh my god i just don't know we never talked about it is so tragic so i would like everybody in dying matters week to have a what matters most conversation with the people who matter the most for them as a gift to their future selves oh thank you um, it's been great to talk to you about this. <laughs> I was texting Joe saying it's got a bit of a lump in my throat talking about it. It's such a nice topic, but it's a hard one. It's something I've grown up talking about, but I mean, yeah, lots of my family and other friends, they haven't necessarily enjoyed talking about it. But thank you so much for coming on as a guest, um, especially in quite an important week um, in the year. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for listening to Rad Chat. Um, your hosts today have been Damon Joe Anderson and Joe McNamara. Huge thank you to our guest, Dr. Catherine Mannix. Uh, please go to our YouTube page to see a live recording of the podcast. Uh, and if you're utilising the podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions that we're going to post, uh, along with any links, links to resources, literature and um, Catherine's books as well. To get your accredited CPD certificate, please complete the Google form that we're going to link with the podcast. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Good night.